um, in view of the in view of the progress that we have made, and also the level of competency that now exists uh, amongst our amongst the staff in fetal medicine, uh, we have now changed the format of our meetings to discuss cases in an MDT format. But as you realize that fetal medicine is very broad and covers almost every specialty. So depending on the case that we'll be discussing, we'll invite a relevant specialty uh, who will help us to discuss the case and also to help uh, in terms of the understanding. Um, these are the beginnings. So bear with us, we may expect some uh, uh, to the problems as we go, but we are hoping to refine this meeting, to refine the uh, content of the discussion, and also to depend the evidence uh, which will be shared within the discussion platform as we go. So thank you so much. So today I've invested, I've invited a guest uh, um, panelist amongst us, who is Mr. Chisamatanga. Uh, Mr. Chisamatanga is an orthopedic surgeon and he is also um, uh, a, a, a sub-specialized pediatric orthopedic surgeon. Today, we'll be discussing uh, a case on uh, skeletal dysplasia. So I will ask Dr. Chirume, let me start by sharing his screen. I'll ask Dr. Chirume to, to come and present the case. When Dr. Chirume finishes the case, we will open the floor for discussion, and uh, but before we discuss, we will allow our guest panelist, Mr. Chisamatanga, to comment uh, on the case. Then uh, we can ask questions. We can have a, dis uh, a more detailed discussion on what is uh, going on on the case. So I will give this time to Dr. Chirume. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Good morning, um, Dr. Shirume. Thank you, Dr. Zerenga, for the kind um, introduction. Dr. Shirume, one of the registrars in the fetal maternal medicine unit. So um, I'm going to I'm going to take you through I'm going to take you through the case. Uh, I hope my slides are, are clear. Someone can confirm. Are my slides clear? Hello. Yes, they are. They are clear. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to present the case of fetal skeletal dysplasia. Um, I hope uh, we we've all come across um this kind of people maybe in town or where we live uh, in the high densities or maybe in low densities. We have all, we have all come across um, uh, this kind of, uh, of people uh, where they are short stature, short limbs, or even uh, some skeletal deformities. So up to date, um, at our unit, uh, we've scanned about 10,000 uh, women. And of those 10,000, uh, we have noted 13 of them uh, with skeletal dysplasias. And these are the distribution of the various skeletal dysplasias. We can note that uh, the commonest one is achondroplasia, constituting about 15%, um, as well as uh, thanatophobic uh, dysplasia, which are the worst lethal forms of uh, the dysplasias. So I just tried to put a background in the form of introduction so that at least we are on the same page. So the skeletal dysplasias or osteochondral dysplasias, they encompasses a heterogeneous group of bone 
and uh, cartilage disorders. So these are the disorders of the bone as well as the cartilage. And thank God, with advancing in imaging now and antenatal testing, there is now improvement in the ability to diagnose this condition, even in the antenatal period, which means that we, 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 we can diagnose it antenatally. There's no point of waiting for the baby to be delivered for us to make a diagnosis because of this advance in imaging as well as the antenatal testing. And it also been recommended in literature that if you find a lethal skeletal dysplasia, there's recommendation for termination. But in some circumstances, uh, maybe the parents might uh, advocate for continuation of pregnancy. And this, um, uh, this recommendation and also the approach to those who want to continue the pregnancy should have a more disciplinary approach where we need a neonatologist um, and also other, other disciplines in the further management. That's why we had to invite other specialties. Because in managing these cases, we need other disciplines to be in view. So this case would try to highlight the pertinent issues to us as caregivers when we, when we are presented with a prenatal diagnosis of skeletal dys dysplasia. So we're going to go through some of the pertinent issues which we need to know as caregivers. So it's a case of a two-year-old um, now in a third pregnancy, uh, late registered to our fetal unit for fetal anatomic survey. After she had the second trimester scan, we showed shortening uh, of uh, long bones. So there's no family history of skeletal dysplasia and no history of uh, substance abuse. The obstetric history was insignificant. There was no contiguity or even gestational diabetes. She had previous and complicated vaginal deliveries and um, both children are health at home and they are growing well with no noted deformities. So this was the initial assessment when we saw it, when she came at two weeks, uh, two days. So the long bones, the femur there, uh, we can see on the left side, that's, that's a short femur there. And after measurement, it was about 18 millimeters and it was below the second uh, center on the femur. And also the humerus was measured, uh, measuring 20, and was again uh, on, the, um, on the lesser uh, second deviation. So uh, with that in mind, we also know that uh, if you got an early diagnosis of shortening of these uh, limbs, it have a very little uh, prognosis. If we, if we go on, we, go, we went on further to look at the tibia and the fibula. Again, they were very short, all of them below the second standard, right? If you look at the left there, the tibia, very short, 70 millimeters, and the fibula, 11 millimeters, quite short, um, long bones. Then we went on further to look at the radius. There's no bone which is left unmeasured here. So we look at the radius there, a short radius, again, below the second center, and then Auna, very short, 16, again, uh, below the second center. And uh, if you are to look at the foot there, it's almost a, a, a normal foot. So this is um, the measurements which are supposed to be done when someone suspects a, a, a skeletal deformity. So you go on, on all the long bones, the humerus, the femur, the tip fib, the radius, and the arm. So if you went on to look for other uh, features, there are still bones at the spine. We need to look at the spine there. You can see there's kyphosis at the spine. You can see the spine. It's not a straight spine. There's a kyphosis, which is a typical of achondroplasia. And if you are to look at the skull there, at the skull bones, you can see that um, it's quite a huge uh, head with a, uh, a frontal bossy. You can see this frontal bossy where the arrow is pointing there, right? An extension of the forehead. Uh, we used to see them on some of our colleagues at high school there. The frontal bossy, it's a typical for controversy. And also if you had to look at the nasal bridge, it's a flat uh, nasal bridge there and a depressed uh, uh, nasal bridge, you can see it on the picture there, which are some of the typical findings uh, 
for a chondroplasia. So, which means when you are presented uh, with these cases uh, where someone is suspecting um, skeletal dysplasia, we go on all the bones, femur, humerus, radius, ulna, tibia, fibia, the spine, and the head, looking for any evidence of um, skeletal deformities. So this is a picture uh, measuring the head circumference and um, the abdominal circumference, right? As we know that when we do our biometry, we measure these things. They are also helpful in trying to contrast um, the images to say, if you are going to take the thoracic ratio to the abdominal circumference ratio, what's the difference in that ratio? We also measure this head circumference as well as the abdominal circumference. And we can see that they were in the normal range, the head circumference there in the 47 center and uh, the abdominal circumference in the sixth center. And the problem was with the shortening of those bones, which I have already indicated. If we, we went on to plot um, uh, these findings on the growth uh, charts, we can see the trend here, right? So if we are to look at this with the fetal weight, it's a bit uh, the, because we know with fetal weight, it's an average of the head circumference, the abdominal circumference, and the femur length. And if you are to zoom in, in those specific parameters, the head circumference, you can see that it's in the normal range there at the fifth percentile. And we, if you are to look at the abdominal circumference, it's again in the normal range at the, at the fifth centile. But if you are to zoom in at the femur there, it's quite below the second centile. And this is the one affecting the estimated fetal weight to be below. So when we ever you report, uh, we report the fetal weight, um, the clinician should interpret to see what were the parameters like to be specific. What was the head circumference? What was the, the, the abdominal circumference? What was the femur? What is the parameter which is outside all this? We can see that uh, with these parameters, it's likely to have a weight which is low because of the femur length there. And if you go on to look at other bones, the humerus, the ulna, and uh, the tibia, as well as the radius, all of them were plotted, plotted below the uh, third center, which means they were very short bones. And, uh, again, the tibia, the fibula, the radius, plotting them again, you can see there, the dots, they are quite below uh, the, the, the third center. So now, this is the summary of other findings um, on this on this features. The chest to abdominal circumference, we have to calculate it, right? Because it's uh, been shown to have a prognostic marker in terms of the um, lethality of the condition. So the chest to abdominal circumference for this one was 0 0.61, which was quite, um, quite low. And if we measure the femur length to the abdominal circumference, Again, 0 0,1, uh, which was um, uh, quite uh, small. And I wanted to highlight also to you that um, the picture, I'll show you another picture in front there, where there was a bell shape of the chest um, when we measured this circumference. The chest was quite small, like um, those bells. I'll show you the picture of, um, of that um, ratio. The amniotic fluid was normal. The placenta was a grade two with normal Dopplers. There were no fetal defects from head to, to toe, which were identified, and uh, no scan features of any uh, infection. So at this point in time, an impression of a, a lethal skeletal dysplasia was um, made. This was mainly basing on that ratio. Uh, we see that the chest to the abdominal circumference uh, was quite uh, small. They always um, say that um, uh, Bad boys are, are small. So these uh, fetuses with a small uh, chest, they are associated with a bad prognosis. So a lethal skeletal dysplasia was, uh, the diagnosis of a lethal skeletal dysplasia was made secondary to query a control uh, plasia. So the plan at this point was to do a more disciplinary, to do thorough counseling uh, with the patient to advise you that, look, the fetus here is uh, quite, um, is it quite severe and uh, lethal skeletal dysplasia. And uh, the option, uh, if you want, we can still continue to screen for the specific genetic uh, mutation. And um, we can terminate if you want, but uh, the parents said that ah, there's no need for doing further uh, genetic uh, counseling uh, since uh, this condition is quite lethal. Even finding that there's a genetic mutation 
won't help. We still want a termination. There's no need of um, spending uh, more money in trying to find the genetic mutations. Also, no, after noting that uh, in the East, there was no family list of uh, this um, genetic problems. We thought it was a sporadic case, uh, which uh, the current rate might be different if it's a, it's a sporadic case in terms of the future uh, fertility plans. So the, 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 the parents opted for termination. Now she's uh, 24 weeks, I called them um, yesterday. They said uh, they are going to be terminated today by the obstetrician. So they are, we are still waiting for the termination so that at least uh, we can send you the pictures after the termination to confirm whether what we had presented to you was also the findings at the delivery of uh, this fetus. So in, in conclusion and recommendation for these cases, uh, I want to, 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 to recommend that in the antenatal period, there are certain ultrasound scan um, findings, which when we see them, uh, we should um, be on the high alert. So if we see a short femur, we know that we are measuring femur for every woman who comes to the, uh, to the, to the for an ultrasound scan in terms of the biometry. So for a femur which is less than the three standard deviation, right? We should send a feather for further evaluation of other bones as well as the spine and the head to look for other um, pathognomic features of this uh, skeletal dysplasia. Right? If we see someone with severe microamelia, or maybe do the thoracic to chest, uh, thoracic to abdominal circumference, if, I, if you did the thoracic um, chest circumference of less than 50%, of course, we know that currently there are no charts trying to assess the, the thoracic ratio of the gestation. But if you find it that it's a small chest, we need to send this woman for, for further evaluation. Also, if there's uh, polydramnos, or maybe if you do the femur length to abdominal circumference, because we know we measure the femur length, measure the abdominal circumference. If that ratio is less than 0 0.16, again, we should send uh, those uh, fetuses for further evaluation. And uh, if we see that on the long bones, there's a low bone echogenicity. When you're scanning there, you find out ah, this bone doesn't look normal. There's um, hypogenic appearance. They should be further followed up uh, for a proper um, survey. And um, we would need also to do radiographs for those fetus who suspect a skeletal displacement. Now, for those uh, parents uh, who might want a continuous, uh, to continue the pregnancy, I know in our case, uh, the parents said, ah, let's terminate the pregnancy. But in some circumstances, they might want uh, to prolong the pregnancy. In that circumstance, we need a continuous assessment uh, to verify variability, as well as to monitor for any respiratory compromise and uh, to perform the C-section at a stage that affords less, lessened likelihood of operative interventions. We know that the head might be big, uh, so we need to time them for a uh, C-section at an appropriate time for those who would want to continue. And a multidisciplinary approach so that uh, they might help with resuscitation, maybe deliver, since we said some of them might have a, a, a narrow chest. So I think I might uh, end here yeah, my case and um, wait for discussions. Then I'll proceed with the discussion thereafter. Any questions or any additions or subtractions? Thank you very much, Dr. Chirume. And, um... Probably before we ask uh, for any questions, maybe I would like to ask uh, Mr. Samatanga to, to comment um, on what has been presented so far. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Erenga. Um, so yeah, we, we, we get to see um, quite a number of patients uh, that make it through to our cells. Um, so I'm working at uh, Kyo Children's Hospital in Ulawayo, and this is, um, highly specialized pediatric orthopedic um, hospital where we do consultation, we uh, then offer um, both non-surgical and surgical treatment uh, with regards to some of these, uh, these cases that come through. 
Um, what we tend to see mostly, I think, uh, because by I think by nature of being surgeons is um, osteogenesis imperfecta, and um, we 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 sometimes see them uh, with horrendous um, deformities, and some of them, I think, also because uh, most can't afford um, treatment when they're they're quite young. Um, they come in with, uh, with, uh, with deformities that are quite severe. And then um, these are the deformities out of affecting their, their quality of life. So I think one of the, some of the approach that we have when we see these kids is um, uh, like anything uh, that's surgical, we try and uh, you know, minimize uh, complications uh, so if there's something that we can do, which is non-surgical, we try and go for that. Uh, but invariably, especially with the kids with um, uh, osteogenesis imperfecta, it's, it's very difficult to, to treat them non-surgically because the bones, are, I think as has been mentioned about skeletal dysplasia, uh, they are quite weak and uh, bone metabolism in itself is not, is not um, normal. So invariably they are going to either break or they are also going to have a deformity that might affect, uh, say, the way they move. Um, so we, if we see them early, um, sometimes we, we, we advocate for prophylactic rotting. Um, the other thing that we're also doing is uh, trying to work on bone metabolism. So for example, if a child comes in uh, with, uh, say, osteogenesis imperfecta, they are in pain, um, and say, uh, well, they, of course, they might have a deformity. What we then do is we offer them uh, bisphosphonates. Um, and um, initially, what we do is we give them calcium and vitamin D supplements for about a month, and then uh, we give them uh, an infusion of uh, bisphosphonates. So they come in for admission, give them an infusion, stay with us for about a day. And then if they are stable, uh, we then uh, send them uh, off on uh, continuation of calcium and vitamin D. And then uh, if we are then planning for surgery, we then do the thing with after uh, three months after this, this um, uh, treatment. So that at least by the time we go to surgery, some some or some or the the bone metabolism is is at a balance. The bone is a bit stronger, and um, and then at least it it allows um, perhaps bone healing to then okay. So that's that's essential what we do. And then of course you've got other um, kids that come in with maybe uh, uh, monoostrotic fibrous dysplasia with a deformity, say in in the problem of femur. So then it affects even their gait. And you can see that if they continue with this deformity, then they will end up with problems around the hip. They might need a hip replacement earlier. Or you get someone that comes in, maybe they're in pain and you take an X-ray and then you see that, okay, the problem of femur is quite weak because of uh, fibrous dysplasia. Sometimes we then offer them again, prophylactic uh, fixation before, uh, before the break. I think the beauty about um, having a hospital like ours is now that, uh, like you're saying, we are doing a multidisciplinary approach. Um, and then sometimes it's usually our end um, as the surgeons or the intervening uh, uh, people that maybe we will lose the ball. But now with our, our, our setup where the patients come in, uh, we treat them for free. We do investigations for free. If there's that medication that we need to give, we, we give it for free. And then I think it, it helps to complete the picture because at the end of the day, it's a patient that, say, when we then treat and maybe re refer back either to the GP or mm -hmm. to yourselves, you can have a full picture of you know what can transpire if, for example, you start with the uh, prenatal diagnosis and you take care of the, the children with, in conduct injection with the pediatricians when the child is born and then ourselves. So you can then have, um, I think, options for those that decide not to terminate. So I think, yeah, in, in a nutshell, that's what I can say. So we, 
we are excited, I think, to be part of, uh, of yourselves and also to be able to offer something on the curative side that um, helps uh, with the improvement of life of these kids. Thank you. Um, th th thank you so much, uh, Mr. Stamatanga. Just one more question. Do you guys have a role in those who persist and um, go on to, to deliver babies with the thanatophoric dysplasia or those uh, who end up delivering maybe babies with achondrogenesis? Do, 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 you have, uh, do you get to see those babies at all? Or they, they all end up in the hands of neonatologists and pediatricians? Uh, so I think we, when, when the kids are born, there is a role of course to, for, for us to also be involved in the multidisciplinary um, approach. But of course, it's, it's also something that um, I'm sure you'd have started the discussion to, to the parents or the caregivers that uh, in terms of prognosis, these are some of the ones where the prognosis is not very, very good. Um, but if there is intervention that we can offer, which improves the quality of life, but it does not put the, the patient at risk of dying earlier than uh, they, they are supposed to, then yes, we can offer that. But I think um, the, the, the point still being that as a multidisciplinary team, definitely we do have a role. And um, our role is not always to operate. Sometimes our role is to say, look, uh, in this particular case, maybe an operation might not be the, the best way to go. So uh, sometimes it's better to hear it from, from the person that's going to be offering the care to say, okay, in this particular case, we are going non-operative. Thank you. The, the, thank you so much for, for those comments. Um, Hey, do we have any questions from the participants in terms of uh, the case that have been presented? Do we want to ask something on prenatal diagnosis or something on postnatal uh, surgical care? Do we, do we have any questions? Um, I think if you do have any questions, you are more than welcome to to speak or to raise your hand so that we can identify you before we proceed to the next case. Before we allow Dr. Chirume to just do a brief discussion to just familiarize us with the, with the conditions. Uh, fetal skeletal dysplasia generally, in terms of fetal medicine terms, they are common. But in terms of the pediatric side, probably they could be said they are not very common um, because uh, they lead their type, they, most of them they don't get born or they just die immediately after birth. So, but on the fetal medicine side, we, we see all of them before uh, the, 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 you know, the, outcome, the outcomes have uh, sort of happened. So you can see from our database that the, the instance for us is around one in, in a thousand, which is fairly common for fetal medicine because it's about 100,000 women a year, and we are not seeing all the Zimbabwean women. So I'm just imagining if we're seeing all the Zimbabwean women, probably we will see more cases than what we are reporting at the, at the moment. So yeah, so it's a fairly common condition which we should uh, be familiar with, uh, know the basic principles of screening for it, and also know the basic um, uh, uh, assessments that should be done if you are suspecting skeletal dysplasia of any form. Um, do you have any questions? If we do not have any. Yeah, uh, okay, I think it's just a, a mic that has just come, come off. Uh, while Dr. Shume is preparing to just carry on, let me announce and say this meeting will, will have C CPD points. So make sure you, um, during this meeting, you submit your details on the WhatsApp, on the chat platform, so that the, the team can send you your CPD points for attending this meeting. So please take care of that. And uh, you should also be aware that uh, 
The next meeting after this one will be more of a webinar, it will be on a webinar platform. So it will not be on Zoom. So the link for registering to be in the meeting will be sent to you uh, during the week. Then after the, uh, that, you'll be able to, to register and join the meeting. So without wasting much time, I'll ask Dr. Shumi to continue so that we, we stick to our time. So he will do a brief discussion so that we have a general understanding of uh, scleral dysplasia. All right. Um, okay, thank you, Dr. Virenga. So I'm going to continue on the, um, on the discussion. Okay, so, um, so the definition already said uh, this encompasses just a heterogeneous group of uh, bone and cartilage disorders. And uh, the quoted figure in the United States is about one in 4,000, uh, but um, about 25% of them are born as still birth and 30% uh, uh, die in the neonatal period. So in this discussion, I'm going to mainly zoom in uh, in terms of the approach. Uh, maybe someone is sent to us saying, ah, we have not some short femur. Uh, how do you approach in uh, those circumstances? So the way to do it is, um, so I try to choose the bone, uh, which we know that, uh, we are more like everyone is more likely to measure it like a femur. So someone might be sent with a, a short femur. So the next question uh, will be, um, is there one or both femurs are there? I know it might sound um, uh, not academic, but this is what it should be done. Huh? So is are there all the femurs present? That's the next, that's the first question. If they are present, are they of the same length Maybe there might be difference in, in length. If they are the same, how long is that femur? We need to know how long uh, is that femur, right? So if that femur is short, that's where our starting point is. The next point is to say, um, in comparison to the GA, how is that femur as we had already seen there? Is it below the third centile? Is it... Um, on the, in the two to three standard deviation, or is it above the six standard deviation? That alone have got a bearing in terms of um, to trying to understand the lethality of the condition. We also need to compare that femur to the by uh, parietal diameters to screen also for trim, trisom 21 uh, risks. So if we find that the femur is short, is within this standard deviation, would now go on further to evaluate other bones, right? So we'll go on to look at the tibia, the fibula, and the foot to try to find out are other bones affected, right? So if one bone is only involvement, let's say this is only the femur which is involvement. So you're more likely to be dealing with maybe a limb reduction defects, or maybe it might be amputation uh, from amniotic fluid veins, or might be from maternal uh, diabetes as a differential. As opposed to if there are more than one bone which are um, affected, um, as we measure those uh, long bones, we need to measure from the diaphysis to the diaphysis. And also we need to be aware of the caved bones in terms of when we are measuring. So if we have got um, more than one bone which is affected, we need to do the meds. Uh, with the meds now, we are comparing the femur to other bones like the femur to the foot or the femur to the abdominal circumference, right? And out goes, right? So from the meds now, we know that the standard deviation of that shortening of the limb have got a bearing in terms of the lethality of the disease. So if you got a standard deviation of between two to three, you are most likely dealing with a mild uh, skeletal dysplasia. But if it goes on to four, we are more likely to deal with an, uh, with an, with an unlethal and above six, it's 
been associated with a great uh, bad prognosis. Also, we need to be aware that the earlier we diagnose this shortening of bones, it's associated with a worse uh, prognosis in terms of the, of the condition. And um, late onset might be associated with a familiar or growth restriction, which means we need to know it, what gestation we have diagnosed we diagnose that shortening of the femur early on in pregnancy. That's associated with a waste prognosis. That's why we're canceling the mother, that this is a waste prognosis. We have diagnosed early. And entertaining other uh, differential like familiar or growth restriction. Also, we need to plot for the pregnancy. We need to do serial measurements of those bones. In our case, we're not able to do that with well, the woman uh, advocated for termination. But if you are going to do the serial measurements of uh, those uh, bones, you might see that in some circumstances, you might find a progressive uh, shortening of those limbs, right? What I mean is that we do the measurement, maybe at 20 weeks, we find that the femur is in the second, in the below the, um, to standard deviation. Then you do it maybe at 30 weeks. Now it's in the fourth standard deviation. So there's progressive shortening in that condition. Um, it's usually associated with achondroplasia. So for our case, maybe if we're able to do the serial measurements, that's the pattern we were more likely to find for the diagnosis of achondroplasia. Now, so this was a study uh, which was done by Thomas et al. Uh, with colleagues, um, where uh, he was uh, trying to look at some of the uh, features uh, of uh, suspected skeletal dysplasia, right? So he came up with a program on the internet, which you can feed in uh, your numbers, right? It's tedious to be calculating the femur to the abdomen, the chest to the abdomen. It's quite tedious. So this guy was a mathematician, a physician. Then he went on to be a doctor. So he came up with a program where you just feed in, plug in your femur length, plug in your abdominal circumference, plug in your chest circumference, and you get all those ratios and you can interpret them. So this is the site where you can get uh, that program. Now, with achondroplasia now, because we had seen uh, the conditions which we said are common as the fetal dysplasia. So now I'm zooming in one by one, trying to look at specific pathognomic feature for each so that we are able to diagnose. It's quite important uh, for those sonographers to know the features for each condition. Number one, it will lessen uh, the amount of the prenatal tests which you might do. These tests are quite expensive. These genetic mutation tests are quite expensive. So if you know the pathognomic feature, you're going to go straight to the appropriate test and not wasting time, as well as um, not ex wasting the, 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 the funding of, the, of, our, of our patients, right? And also it will help in prognosticate our patients. As we have seen in our case, we had seen all those features and we're able to prognosticate. So in our chondroplasia, the typical presentation will be the progressive shortening of the limbs, as we had already said. If we are to look at the diagrams on the left there, we can see the plot of the femur with the gestation in the small dots there. We can see this progressive uh, shortening of that femur. The abdominal circumference remains in the normal range, continuing the pregnancy, but the femur length is progressively uh, shortening. Also, if you are to look on the picture on the right there, right? That's what we call a um, proximal, um, uh, proximal, uh, this, uh, proximal diaphysis metaphysical angle, right? It's increased. That angle is more than one thing usually in a chondroplasia. We used to be taught that at fetal medicine that we need to measure our femur length from the one diaphysical end to the other diaphysical end there. But if you are to look at where the deficit is ending and compare that angle to the metaphysia, you'd see there's some angulation in a chondroplasia. So we need to look for this feature when we are scanning these patients. And this angle, if it is more than 130, it is typical of a, a chondroplasia, right? And um, 
This study was done uh, trying to look at uh, different angles of uh, chondroplasia. And this guy, um, Carl, uh, published in, in the year 2012 uh, that with a chondroplasia, you get widening of that femoral proximal uh, diaphyseal angle, right? So, which means we are now going also to the meds part. Ultrasound scan will also involve meds where we are measuring the protractors at angle. And in this study, you noted that five out of six affected fetuses had an angle of greater than one third, right? In our patient, uh, we didn't uh, measure, measure it, but we're supposed also to look at that angle. And these are the normal ranges, right? At 22 weeks, the, the, the angle should be 98 degrees and the 32 weeks should be 105. So if you find an angle greater than 130, you really, it's really typical of um, achondroplasia, right? If you go on to look at other features of achondroplasia, like the kyphoscolosis, I have already shown you that in our patient, the spine was not a straight spine. You find a spine with the hump there, right? Even on a scan, then you're suspecting that this could be a control uh, place, right? And if you are to look at the hands, right? There's a sign where they say there's a wider spacing uh, between the third and uh, uh, the fourth, uh, the fourth, uh, the fourth fingers. There's a wider space there, right? I know for those people who like to be on the internet, um, this is a sign where they say to live long and to prosper. Uh, they used this sign uh, at the internet today. I don't know, I was trying to find out whether someone who started this had a chondrosplasia or maybe it was a coincidence, right? So that's the typical sonographic uh, feature which we find with chondrosplasia. And uh, on the right there, that's the um, uh, frontal bossing, which we, we have also highlighted uh, for our patients. So all these features need to be looked for on our, uh, at, at the bones to try to make a diagnosis of a, a chondroplasia. Um, but I also have um, a good news for you to say that uh, with some of these a chondroplasia, they are not lethal, especially the non-lethal. Uh, we know this famous um, someone who won uh, the swimming competition, she won a medal. Uh, but she had a uh, chondroplasia, the non lethal type. So it doesn't spare much of the function as well as the intelligence uh, of the, this uh, woman. So those are the key features we need to look for uh, if we are to diagnose um, a chondroplasia. Now, going to other uh, dysplasias now, uh, which are quite uh, lethal, like the thanatophoric, which is 100% lethal. Osteogenic uh, imperfecta, like uh, Dr. Shamatanga was mentioning, and the achondrogenesis, and the short rib polydactyly group, and the hypophosphatemia. There are also specific uh, features which we need to, uh, to look for, right? So, besides the shortening of uh, the lips, uh, which all these conditions have, we now need to go to zoom in each condition by each, trying to characterize it. Right. So now the next step will be to say now, uh, are there any any fractures? I think I might try to look for 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 the picture. So after finding the shortening of the limb, the next question is to say, are there any uh, fractures? How is that important to look for uh, for those fractures and bleeding on the ultrasound scan? It's it's going to zoom in in terms of our um, in terms of our differentials to say if there are fractures and there's bleeding on the X-ray, right? We are going to be dealing with uh, these two, right? The osteogenic imperfecta or the achondro the achondrogenesis. These two are the ones where we uh, we see uh, the. Um, that's the ones where we see the, um, the fracturing and beating on the, on the ultrasound scan. So that's the first step to try to distinguish these two from the rest of these uh, five uh, groups. Now, 
After zooming into these two, we found that in the scan, there are fractures and uh, there is a bleeding on the x-rays. To further separate uh, these two, we are going to look at the spine now to say, are there any uh, calcifications, right? Are there any uh, ossifications on the spine, right? So with osteogenic imperfecta, you would see the whitish uh, stuff on the spine show that there's ossification, but with achondrogenesis now, uh, there won't be any os ossifications. So, or maybe to better this, let me try to, to show you a picture so that at least visualization is, is better for, for some of us. So I'm trying to, to so I'll, I'll, I'll load in the picture right and uh, i'll show you at the end right how to separate these two now you would need now to go on further sorry for that you would need now to go on further i'm trying to just check for the pictures so now need now also to go on further to look at um a thanatotrophic uh dysplasia the one on the top with the 100 percent uh, lethality with this one now uh you get what we call a clover leaf appearance on ultrasound scan uh, where we would see again I will, I will show the the picture so that I will, I will better demonstrate I'm trying to to, to find out uh, the picture so that I, I can try to so you get a clover leaf appearance of the head for the tonatotrophic uh, dysplasia and for this short rib polyductyl group right so what you find with that is um a bell shaped right that's a bell-shaped chest. When we say a bell-shaped, we are saying the, that chest to the abdominal circumference uh, ratio is uh, quite short, right? So that um, it appears like a bell. I know we are used to those bells uh, like um, in the old days. You know the shape of that bell, the ring bell, the ordinary ring bell, which we use maybe if you want to enter the ICU, you, you saw that bell outside the ICU where it would appear that the chest would be small, but the abdomen would be big. That would be the appearance of a, a short rib polyductyl group, right? Then with the um, hypophosphatasium, right? Uh, we get uh, what we call, we get what we call um, hypogenic lesions on the ultrasound scan. Um, I'm, I'm hearing that we are almost uh, time up, but okay. Uh, I think I'll I'll, 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 I'll I'll stop here. My time is out, but I wanted to show you the, the picture. Maybe if I get more time, I'll show you the picture to try to demonstrate these different um, pathognomic features for each. Uh, th thank you so much, Dr. Shirume. Um, I think uh, you can see uh, all of you that uh, uh, skeletal dysplasia is a very broad topic, which we can never exhaust in one hour. Um, this is just the introduction of some of these, what may be considered by others as rare abnormalities, but in our field, they are very common. So the discussion will keep on going uh, as we continue to meet and to discuss. So do not worry. Uh, Dr. Chirume will, will probably re uh, repeat for those with interest who want to know more, we'll probably repeat this presentation in the afternoon when we do the, the meetings at the uh, medical school. So you can tune in uh, at the, using the Zoom from the medical school where you will show you the details, the tables, the comparison of the conditions. Um, I will leave the room for questions, but before I do that, let me answer the question that Dr. Madembo asked. Where do we measure the thoracic circumference? We measure it at the level of the heart, where we do the four chamber view. So where we do the four chamber view is where we measure the thoracic circumference. Uh, I think I've answered that question. Um, do you have any other questions you want to ask, whether myself, Dr. Chirume, or we want to ask uh, Mr. Samatanga, um, our special guest uh, who is with us? Do you have any questions to, to ask on skeletal dysplasias?
So if we do not have any questions, let me take this time to thank uh, Mr. Samatanga for taking his time to attend this meeting. Thank you so much, and uh, we really appreciate your expertise uh, in this field. We will continuously engage you whenever we come across uh, cases that involve your field. Uh, to everyone who has managed to understand, thank you so much. Like I said, this is the beginning of uh, FITABITS in the MDTs. We'll be inviting more and more people of relevant specialties, depending on the case under discussion. Otherwise, I want to wish you a lovely weekend. And uh, next meeting will be on a webinar platform. Please take note of this, that these Friday meetings will be webinar platforms. Uh, and uh, take an opportunity to register the day before so that we are not in convenience on the same day. But otherwise, have a lovely weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Varenga. Maybe you. before we go, we, we um, are also doing some um, webinar meetings on uh, pediatric orthopedics every Tuesday, 7.30. So mm -hmm. if you guys are okay, I could just send some of the topics that we will be discussing. If they are of interest, you can attend. The pediatricians have been attending. Um, please do send us. We are more than welcome to, to partake. All right, thank you. And also, um, I'll be coming to Arare uh, to do a clinic on the 23rd, 24th, and 25th of this month. So if there are any uh, patients that you'd want to refer, you refer them to the um, perennial rehabilitation department and then we'll get to see them. Perfect, perfect. So so I think uh, the Vita Medicine um, Nidras, please take note of the dates that Mr. Samataga has mentioned, 23rd, 24th, and 25th of uh, March, right? Yes. So yeah. I think it's two weeks time. Yeah, please take off this day so that when we see patients, we know we have to refer them to Parinatwa um, uh, Rehabilitation Department. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So this is so much.